Praise God, church. Praise God again. Uh, I'm here once more to share with you uh, the health nugget section. So we'll start with a word of prayer as uh, people settle down. So let's bow our heads and pray. Our kind and most gracious Father, we thank you, God, for this wonderful Sabbath. We thank you that you've enabled us to come here to share with fellow brethren your grace and mercy upon us, O oh God. God, as we enter into this session of learning about our health, help us, O oh God, that we may use this knowledge to benefit us and those who are around us. This we pray, trusting and believing in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So I'm Dr. Nyabuti, and today's topic will be a continuation of last week's uh, discussion. We'll now be discussing one of the complications that arise from deep venous thrombosis, which is acute pulmonary thromboembolism. So just to quickly take you through that, uh, I'll start by defining it. This is when you have a blockage in the pulmonary artery and its branches by materials that may originate anywhere else from the body. Remember, there's a relationship between the heart and the lung. Uh, the right side of the heart usually pumps blood into the lung through a, a vessel called the pulmonary artery. And this uh, pulmonary artery has branches that supply uh, blood into the lungs. And if any of the branches are blocked, this uh, condition is called pulmonary embolism. And the embolism can be any material. It can be a clot, which is the most common uh, material to block the uh, pulmonary arteries. It can also be fat, uh, maybe from surgeries where you have fat embolism. And embolism is whereby you form a clot in the body, and then that clot dislodges, dislodges from the site of origin and goes to any part of the body. You can also have amniotic fluid in those who are pregnant, and also air can be a material that blocks the pulmonary artery. Uh, on the epidemiology, it's usually the third most frequent cause of acute cardiovascular syndrome. This is second to heart attacks, which is called myocardial infarction, and cerebrovascular accidents, which are strokes. And um, they, it causes a, it's a life-threatening illness and has a high mortality, over 300 deaths in a year. And that is why we need to know of pulmonary embolism symptoms and when to seek help. The incidence increases with age, especially in women, uh, after the age of 75. So what are the sources of these materials that can go into the lung and cause uh, blockage? It can come from the lower extremity, and 50% of the cases come from the proximal veins, which are in the thigh. Uh, a third of the cases can uh, arise from um, veins in the lower extremity below the knee, which are called calf veins. And sometimes it can um, arise from veins in the upper extremity or even in the kidney. So what are the risk factors of you uh, getting pulmonary thromboembolism? It can be genetic where you have um, factors that have increased risk of forming clots, like if you have deficiencies in, um, pro uh, if you have factor V laden uh, mutations and if you have protein C and protein S uh, deficiencies, that can lead you to getting pulmonary embolism. You can also have acquired uh, factors, and these are the things that we can try to modify. So the acquired factors can either be provocative factors, such as if you are pregnant, you are at higher risk of forming a clot because your pregnancy is a state that is, uh, in encourages clot formation in your body. If you have had recent surgeries, especially bone or orthopedic surgeries or major surgeries such as pelvic surgeries, if you have been immobilized uh, by either illness or maybe you're traveling uh, long distances or you're just uh, maybe by occupation you tend to sit a lot, um, if you're having um, malignancies, that can also have materials that can encourage clot formation in your body. And also if you're using any form of contraception, especially hormonal contraceptions. Uh, the other re uh, risk factors that can be non-provoking is uh, things like cigarette smoking. Because of the inflammation, it can cause endothelial damage and that can encourage clot formation. Obesity, because of the increased fat layers that can lead to venous stasis and also increase your chances of uh, getting clot formation in your body. So these risk factors can either be divided as strong risk factors, intermediate risk factors, or uh, low risk risk factors. So the strong risk factors which uh, people should be cautious about is either if you have a fracture, 
you've experienced a fracture in the recent one month, if you've had major surgery, which I've said orthopedic surgery, like knee replacement, hip replacement, or uh, being fixed uh, an intramedullary nail, if you've had major trauma, and that might lead to also the fractures. If you've had a previous history of a clot formation in any part of your body, and you've had any form of spinal, inju uh, spinal injury that led you to have surgery. If you are hospitalized, and you're maybe hospitalized and you have invasive uh, gadgets, such as uh, central lines or catheters that can make you uh, get uh, higher risks of getting a clot. If you have uh, infections that can lead to inflammation and also if you have autoimmune diseases which are diseases that are caused by your body uh, attacking your own cells such as uh, sickle, uh, anti antiphospholipid syndrome and inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, the other risk factors could be type 2 diabetes uh, can also lead to inflammation of the endothelium and increases the risk of forming a clot. Uh, if you have uh, varicose veins, which are uh, veins that are in the lower extremities that are dilated with valve ins insufficiency, that can increase your risk of forming clots due to venous stasis. And finally, age. As I said, as you advance in age, you are at a higher risk of forming a clot. So what are the symptoms of uh, pulmonary embolism? One of the symptoms could be difficulty in breathing, either at rest or uh, with exertion. That is in 73% of, of the cases. You can have chest pain. It can either be because of either you're coughing, then you have the chest pain, or just chest pain without coughing. You can also have a shortness of breath when you're lying down flat. It's usually called orthopnea. You can also have signs of DVT, which is where you have either swelling of the leg, or one or both of them, pain in the calf muscles, and also some skin color changes. You can also have coughing of blood, which is called hemoptysis. Uh, the other thing you can have is dizziness, and some of them can be uh, fatal where you even lose consciousness, which is called syncope. You can also have um, arrhythmias, which is abnormal rhythms in the heart. And uh, finally, you can have some changes, which is because of effect of the, the nerves that are compressed, which is called hoarseness of voice. You can have uh, Othner syndrome. So how do you diagnose this uh, pulmonary embolism? We base our diagnosis through clinical evaluation where we take the history, we do a physical evaluation, and there are things that we pick up, and then we do laboratory tests and imaging. So for the clinical uh, evaluation, there's a clinical probability scale that we usually use, which is called a modified wells criteria. And, it's, and this helps us to assess your probability of getting uh, pulmonary embolism, either high, moderate, or low. The laboratory tests that we do are tests that we check for breakdown products of clotting, such as D-dimers. We also check for uh, markers of heart injury, and those are things like troponin, uh, BNP or pro-BNP, and this helps us to see if you have any injury to the heart because of the clot. The clot can either be massive, which is a big clot that can block either the main pulmonary artery, or you can also have uh, blocks in the small vessels, which are subsegmental sub vessels that supply the lung, uh, lung lobes. The other thing we do is imaging, which is the most important, and this is the, this is the way we diagnose uh, pulmonary embolism, which is a CTPA, which is an uh, image that we use to check the uh, visualize the pulmonary arteries down all the way to the subsegmental level to see if there's any block. We do a LAN scintigraphy, which is in those people who cannot take radiation, as preg such as pregnant women or people who have renal failure. And finally, we do an echo to see injuries to the lungs, uh, to the heart, I mean, and also to check for any source of clots, uh, either in the lower extremity by doing a compression ultrasound. So how do we treat pulmonary embolism? We treat it by using medication. Most people uh, are admitted because it's a life-threatening illness, either to the ICU or to the HDU or to the ward. And uh, the first few days, we can give you uh, injections of anticoagulants, which are medication that helps you uh, thin blood or prevent clot formation. And then we can change you to oral medication. For the severe cases where we have impact to the heart and uh, patients are unstable, where they come with low blood pressure, and they're uh, having very poor circulation to the brain, to the kidney, to the lungs. We admit them to ICU and we do what we call thrombolysis, where we inject a drug that uh, dissolves the clot. 
In some cases, we can do surgery where we go inside and remove the clot, which is called surgical embolectomy. And for those who cannot take medication, we use IVC filter, which is a filter that goes into the inferior vena cava to prevent clots from coming all the way from the lower extremity up to the heart and the lungs. What are the complications of pulmonary embolism? It is a very life-threatening disease, so you can actually die out of it. It can cause heart failure, especially on the right side of the heart, which is called copalmonale. In other cases, it can cause increased pressure in the vessels that are in the heart, which is pulmonary uh, hypertension. It can damage the lung and cause a portion of the lung to die, which is lung infarct, and it can also cause fluid accumulation. So how do we prevent this? We prevent it by ensuring that we are mobile and active through exercise. Early ambulation, especially when your doctor encourages you to move after surgery. The other thing is adhering to medications such as anticoagulation. And, and finally, we also use things like compression devices like elastic stockings to prevent clot formation in the lower extremity. I hope you have been blessed, so let us pray. Our kind and most gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for this uh, Health Nugget session. We thank you for the discussion we've had. I pray that, Lord, this information may be of good use to us and benefit all, that, uh, all, who we, all of those who we interact with. This I pray, trusting and believing in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.